Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to this course on conservation economics. I am Dr. Ankur Avadhya. I am an officer in the Indian Forest Service and your instructor for this course. In this course, we shall try to understand how conservation and economics are interlinked. How certain economic decisions, certain bad economic decisions lead to issues of conservation. How they lead to environmental disasters and how we can make use of principles of economics to ensure that we also are able to meet our goals of conservation. And we should also try to explore why conservation is important for the economic well-being of a society. After all, we require economics or we require development to provide certain amenities to our people. And when we do good conservation, we can provide those amenities at a cheaper cost. So on the one hand, economics helps in good conservation. That is good economics helps in good conservation. At the same time, good conservation helps in the development of the society, which is also one of the objectives of economics. And we shall also try to explore how we can use the principles of economics to provide funding for conservation. So these and several other issues will be discussed in this course. This course will be divided into several modules and each module will have three or four lectures. Now, each module will comprise of those lectures that will cover a thematic area in either economics or conservation or their interlinkage. So the first module is what is economics? And in this module, we will have three lectures. The first one is introduction to the course and making of decisions. The second lecture is making decisions part two and interactions, followed by interactions and working of the economy. So we begin with the first lecture, introduction to the course and making decisions. So when we talk about conservation economics, the first question that comes into the mind is, what is conservation economics? That is, what is conservation? What is economics? And how are both of these linked together? So the word conservation is derived from these word roots. Con meaning together and server which means to keep. So essentially, conservation will mean to keep together. And what do you keep together? You keep together the natural environment because it is under threat. In one of the later lectures, we shall explore what is causing this threat. Why is our environment, why are our wildlife in grave danger? And why we need to protect them. Now, we are not protecting these organisms because of our love for these organisms. We are not protecting tigers because we want to protect the tigers or because we are very much affectionate to tigers. Because after all, in most of the human history, we have been killing tigers. Because tiger is a ferocious animal. But over time, we came to this realization that tiger also provides several benefits. Tiger protects the forest. And forests provide us with several benefits, such as clean air and clean water. Forests ensure that our rivers and our streams have water throughout the year. They are perennial in nature. Forests ensure that whenever there is rainfall, all the water does not just reach into the rivers, causing floods, and for the rest of the season, the rivers get dried up. So forests have a role. And where there are forests, there will also be herbivores. Animals such as deer, animals such as sambar. Now, if these animals are there in the forest, these herbivores are there in the forest and there is no carnivore that is predating over them, that is eating them as prey. In 
such a scenario the number of herbivores would go up like crazy they would eat up all the young plants now for a forest to continue it requires that the seeds of the trees they get germinated and the young plants that come up they are able to survive but if herbivores eat up all the young plants then we will have a stage at which the forest will only have old trees and in such a scenario if there is any catastrophe if there is a forest fire if there is a disease then this whole forest will be gone or even if we do not have a disease in uh, in certain point of time these trees that are old they will die off and in the absence of young regeneration the forest will not be able to come back so we need to keep a check on the population of herbivores now how do we keep the population of herbivores in check well we can do two things one we can go into the forest and we can start killing up these herbivores but when we do that in a short time we'll come to the realization that these herbivores are also playing a role in the maintenance of the forest because the seeds of a large number of plants they require these herbivores because when these herbivores eat up the fruits the seeds when they pass through the elementary canal or the gut it becomes more uh, suited for germination so if you just take the seed and put it into the ground it will probably not germinate but once it has passed through the elementary canal of these herbivores the seeds germinate a number of plants also use these herbivores as transporters of their seeds because what happens is if you have a tree in a location and if all the seeds or all the fruits of this tree if they fall down here itself so the young plants that will come up they will be coming up in the shade of the mother tree and when we say the shade of the mother tree it means that these young plants will not have sufficient sunlight and so these plants will not be able to grow so the seeds require a mechanism to transport these fruits and these seeds to other locations and one such mode of transportation is the herbivores so when the herbivores eat up a fruit and the herbivores are moving the plants are stationary but the herbivores are able to move so when they move then this fruit or this seed that is within their stomach that is also moving with them and when these herbivores go to another area and they defecate then the seeds are able to germinate in those areas so what happens is that by using herbivores the trees are ensuring that the plants are coming up away from the shady areas into those areas where they can actually grow into seed into new plants into new trees so the herbivores also have a role in the ecosystem now the question is we need to maintain these herbivores in a quantity that is neither too high because if it is too high then all the plants get eaten nor it is too low because if it is too low then also the forests are gone and when the forests are gone all the benefits that we get from the forest they are also gone so how do we maintain that well we could do one other thing we could keep a track of all the herbivores their populations which herbivore is where keep a track of things and start to kill certain herbivores to maintain the numbers but once we start to do that we'll come into another problem because when a tiger eats up a deer then it is eating that deer that is either diseased or it is too old because of which this deer is not able to run fast but when once humans get into the field once humans are permitted to get into the forest with guns to kill deer to keep the population in check how will they know whether a deer is in the prime of the health or it is a diseased deer in a number of cases what has been found is that whenever people were doing hunting they were killing off the best animal because the humans also have a desire to use things such as the hide of the animals so if you permit humans to kill these herbivores to keep their populations in check what will happen is that they will kill off those animals 
that has the best angle. And in a short while, you will observe that the herbivore population is now only having diseased animals. And so in the long run, the herbivore population again will be gone, which will again have a negative consequence. Now, at the same time, when we use humans to keep these populations in check, just think about how much amount of computations will need to be made. You will have to keep a record of each and every animal find out which animal is healthy, which animal is not healthy, and then track that animal and kill that animal so that the population is kept in check, but you are also killing off only those animals that are either diseased or weak so that the herbivore population remains a healthy population. Now just think of how much amount of effort would be required. The other option is just have a predator in the jungle, just have the tigers. So tigers will do everything for you. What can be better than that? So when we talk about conservation, when we say that we are keeping things together, we are doing a preservation, protection and restoration of natural environment and wildlife. This is not because we are very fond of tigers, but this is because we need the tigers. We need these forests, we need these wildlife because they serve purpose for ourselves. Whenever you find a new disease, people will start to look for cures. Now, a large number of cures are found from different plants. You must have heard of the name of quinine. So quinine is a medicine that is used to treat malaria and quinine comes from the bark of the cinchona tree. Now, of course, the cinchona tree is not infested with mosquitoes. The cinchona tree is not protecting itself. But what is happening is that the cinchona tree produces this secondary metabolite to protect itself from the predators. And the predators of the cinchona tree are things like insects or herbivores. So when you have this quinine in the bark, then the quinine is very uh, bitter in taste and so the herbivores avoid it. The insects also avoid getting into this plant. But then when humans discovered that there is this chemical quinine, so we extracted those chemicals and that was used as an antibalarian. And once you have found this chemical, you can always synthesize it in an industrial reactor. But first of all, you should know that there is such a chemical that can help you. Now to have such chemicals, it is important to have the cinchona trees. Now, whenever we get a new disease, we will again start to look for the chemicals that can be used to treat this disease. And where will we get these chemicals from? From the plants. And where do we have these plants? We find them in the forest. Because when we talk about an agricultural field, then we are talking about a monoculture. People only grow paddy, people only grow wheat, or there are maximum two or three crops that are grown. But when, when you're looking for new chemicals, we have to look for biodiversity. So when we say that we are protecting a forest, we are not protecting a forest because we love the forest. We are protecting the forest because we need the forest. Because forests provide us with certain benefits. And when we talk about economics, economics is also concerned about providing benefits to people. When we say that we want an economic development, it means that we want to have more of more things. That is, we should have more electricity, we should have more vehicles, we should have better houses. That is economic development. But what is the premise of economic development? It is to provide comfort to people. And biodiversity is also doing the same thing. Because if you have good houses, you have good vehicles, you have sufficient electricity, but everybody is diseased. When you say that this society is a very happy society, or if you have a medicine that treats these diseases and people are healthy, what do you prefer? Obviously, people will prefer to have a, a healthy population. And to have that healthy population, we need clean air, we need clean water, we need biodiversity, which will give us these medicines, we need food, we need fibers, we need fodder, we need a lot number of things. And for that, we need to do conservation. That is the preservation, protection, and restoration of the natural environment and wildlife. 
Then what is economics? The word economics comes from these word roots. Oikos means house and nemen is to manage. So economics is the study of how to manage a household. And some of the best economists are the ones who are managing our households. Because in a household, you need to make several decisions. What sort of food needs to be prepared so that everybody is happy? You cannot have just one thing throughout your life. So every day you would need something different. Now to make that something different, you would require, say, food grains, you will require salt, you will require oil. Now, whenever we are having these things and we are making a food item, let us say that we are preparing dosa. Now, when we are preparing dosa, we will require oil. So the oil needs to be had in a quantity that we should always have oil available to make dosa. But we cannot also store a very large amount of oil, otherwise it can get rancid. So things get spoilt if they are stored for a very long period of time. So we need to make a number of decisions. What to buy, when to buy, in how much quantity to buy, what to produce in on different days, and how to decide for whom to produce. Do you want to produce the food taking into account the children in the house or taking into account the adults in the house or taking into account the old people in the house? Because they will have different requirements. They will be happy with different things. The children might like to eat sweet items more, but the adults might want to go for more healthy food items. They want to have salads more. Now the thing is, you need to make these decisions. What to produce? for whom to produce, when to produce, how much to produce. And these are the same decisions that we need to make even at the level of the society. So economics, it is derived from the word roots house and manage. So it is the science of managing the household or the science of managing the society. The study of how society manages its scarce resources. So, you, as a society as well, we have these questions. What to produce? For whom to produce? How much to produce? When to produce? And we take the same insights from the management of household to the management of the society as well. Because the principles remain the same. So this is economics. So economics is a science of making decisions. And these decisions are necessary because there is a scarcity of resources. Now, how are conservation and economics related to each other? So, in conservation, we are saying that we need to keep things together. We need to protect the natural environment. And in the case of economics, we are saying, how does the society manage its scarce resources? So, how are they connected to each other? Well, there is a very great intricate relationship between both of these. Because certain economic decisions have ruined the environment. Things like pollution due to industrial revolution. Now, when we talk about what to produce in a household, what food items to produce, we are making this decision to ensure that everybody gets a sufficient nutritious food and everybody gets the food of their liking. Which means that we want to make everybody happy. In economics terms, we say that we need to maximize the happiness or the surplus. Now, when we are trying to do that, it is possible that in the short run, we make certain decisions that are not the most optimum decisions. So, for instance, a factory is being set up in your neighborhood and you think that, okay, this factory is going to provide us with jobs. But once this factory has been set up, you find out that it gives out so much amount of noise and so much amount of uh, fumes and smoke and noxious gases that it is now difficult for you to even breathe in that air. Now, once this once this factory was being built, you were in the support of this factory. But once it has started its operations, you think that, oh, we were much better before this factory was built in this area. At least we had uh, clean air to breathe. At least we were not having this noise. Now, the thing is, 
the factory in itself is not a bad thing but when we talk about implementation of things we need to know why the factory owners chose not to install noise controlling devices or not to install the smoke controlling devices now these are because of things that are known as externalities we will have a lecture devoted to externalities which helps us understand why people make these decisions that harm everybody in short what is happening is that the factory owner thinks that okay if i install this device there is a cost that is involved but if i do not install this device then i am saving money the consequences are being faced or are being suffered by people in the society but i am not suffering the consequences because i live far away and there the air is good you'll we'll observe that in a large number of countries these days are taking this choice to move their polluting industries to certain other countries so in that case they are saying okay let us have the profits but we should not have this pollution in our country because we want clean air now economics also gives us options to ensure that people install these devices and we'll look at things like the coase theorem that can help us ensure that these pollution controlling devices are installed but what happens is that certain economic decisions especially bad economic decisions they ruin the environment and so the environment needs to be protected in the case of conservation we were talking about the protection of the natural environment so if the natural environment is getting degraded because of certain economic uh, decisions then conservation is required so both of these are related in this way another thing is some economic decisions have led to a total collapse of the ecosystems extinction of species such as over harvesting of whales or extinction of dodo now dodo was a bird that was extensively hunted for meat now this was a flightless bird so it could not fly away to protect itself with the consequence that people hunted it to such an extent that now not a single dodo remains on this planet now this is not just the story of dodo we are doing this every day with a large number of species in the name of economic development so in one of the lectures we shall explore what is the level of this loss that is happening now remember that these species are required for the well functioning of the natural ecosystems the dodo also had a certain role it was required for the germination of certain species of trees and with the dodo gone those trees are also gone so there are a large number of interlinkages now probably when we talk about a new disease there was certain chemical in that tree that could have used that could have been useful in treating the disease but once that tree is gone now you do not have any access to that chemical so certain economic decisions have led to a total collapse of ecosystems and for that we again need to go back to conservation how do we bring the things back so uh, some economic decisions have led to a situation that is calling for conservation now at the same time conservation requires funding and resources now when we talk about economics we are asking the question how does the economy or how does the society manage its scarce resources so we have money but we have also different things that require money we can use the money to construct a school we can use the money to construct a hospital or we can use the money to conserve the forest now how do we ensure that there is some amount of money that is made available for the conservation of forests as well for the conservation of biodiversity now remember here again that we are not trying to conserve biodiversity because we love the forest because man is a selfish being and we want to conserve the forest only because it provides us with certain benefits that we cannot have otherwise but these resources can come only when they are allotted for in the present and the future economic decisions and so if the conservationists and if the economists are not on talking terms then we will have a situation that both will be at loggerheads whereas actually 
both are working for the same goal. Both are working to maximize the surplus of the society. The only difference is that a person who does not know about conservation will have only a limited set of choices. A person who does not know the benefits of forest would say that okay, we can construct a dam. But he would not know that we could have done the same thing for a much cheaper cost. Another example is that when we talk about tidal surges or when we talk about tsunamis, then these days it's a fashion that we should construct a wall along our shores. And these walls will protect against, uh, uh, the, uh, against the sea water that is rushing in during a tsunami. Well, good enough. But then if you have mangrove forests in the same uh, in the place of the wall, you will also have the same thing. And mangrove forests will also protect your biodiversity. They will also clean up the water. They will also clean up the air. Your wall is not going to do that. So you are getting more benefits for a lesser cost. But then to make this decision, the economist knows, needs to know what are the benefits of conservation. And so there is a relationship between economics and conservation. Economic decisions have the power to promote conservation. So when we talk about renewable energy, when we talk about green technology, why are we shifting towards renewable energy? Well, we are re shifting to re uh, towards renewable energy because there is a shortage of petroleum. The price of petroleum increases and when that happens, the cost of energy also increases. At the same time, whenever we are talking about the use of petroleum or coal to generate electricity, it generates huge amounts of pollution. Now, when we talk about renewable energy, we can have the same energy. There is no difference between the electricity that is generated by renewable sources such as solar energy or wind energy and the electricity that is generated out of a thermal power plant. The electricity is the same. But we can have that electricity for a cheaper cost and with less amount of pollution. And a number of economic decisions have been promoting conservation. So when the government says that, okay, we should shift from incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs. The government is making this choice or is promoting this choice so that the amount of energy consumption reduces. Because we only have a limited capacity to produce electricity. But then once we do that, we are also aiding in conservation. So the thing is, can we correlate both of these together so that we can have the best of both worlds? That conservation aids economics so that you are able to get the maximum utility at a cheaper cost. And at the same time, economics aids conservation so that you are able to protect and preserve the environment. So this is the relationship between conservation and economics. And this is what we are going to explore in this course. Now, this course will have several modules. The first one is what is economics with these three lectures, introduction, making decisions, interaction with the working of the economy. The second module will, will explore about conservation. Conservation in the Anthropocene. Anthropos is human beings and seen as a time period. So we call the current era as Anthropocene because in today's era, the impact of human beings on everything, on climate, on geology, on biodiversity, the impact is much greater than any other factor. We say that, that today is the man's age. But the thing is, in this Anthropocene, that is the age of human beings, what is the need for conservation? Do we need it or not? We'll also explore human population growth and food requirements because our populations have been increasing with time. And more people means that we require more resources. And remember that economics is the science of making decisions about how to use the scarce resources for maximum benefit. Now, if the number of people goes up, the per capita availability of resources goes down. So what can we do to ensure that the people still have access to resources? How does population grow? How do we provide it with food and other requirements? 
and when we are meeting these requirements are we meeting that sustainably or unsustainably now this comes to sustainable and unsustainable development the difference is that if you have a resource you can use it to get benefits for a very long period of time or you can use it to get benefit for a short period of time so you would have heard of the story of the hen or the goose that was laying golden eggs now the farmer that was having this goose that was laying golden eggs was getting one egg every day and this was a golden egg so the farmer could have had these eggs for a very long period of time say for many months or many years when we talk about having those eggs for a very long period of time we are talking about sustainable use but what the farmer did was that the farmer got very greedy and said that okay there are eggs inside this hen or this goose let us kill this goose and take out all the eggs once that was done the goose is dead and so now there are no more golden eggs that is unsustainable development so when we talk about sustainability we are asking the question that okay there is this lake this lake has fishes how many fishes do i take out every day so that the fish population is also able to maintain itself and i am able to get this many number of fishes for a very long period of time sustainable development is development that lasts not just for a short period of time but for a very long period of time typically for many generations so we are using resources in such a manner that we are able to meet our present needs while also ensuring that our future generations are also in a position to meet their needs we do not over exploit the resources so that nothing is left for our children and our grandchildren that is sustainable development in the third module we will talk about the modern impacts that necessitate the conservation we will talk about things like climate change plastics oil spills and mining now these are certain impacts because of which conservation has become an urgency we are generating so much amount of plastics that a large quantity is being dumped into the environment and it is leading to negative consequences we are dumping so much amount of carbon dioxide that there is a huge amount of global warming we are observing changes in the climate today we are observing the sea levels rise right before our eyes and if we do not do anything to solve this problem then probably it will be too late so these are certain impacts of human beings that are now necessitating conservation as an urgency in module 4 we will look at threats to wildlife so we will look at push and pull factors so if you talk about any organism it has certain requirements requirements of food requirements of an amiable climate the maximum minimum temperatures requirements of water requirements of space now those areas that provide these requirements give a pull factor to, to these organisms that is the organisms can live in those areas the areas that do not provide these necessities of life give a push factor to the organisms that is the organisms will no longer live in this area now if you have a situation in which the organism is finding that everywhere it is getting pushed and there is no way to live then the species will go towards extinction so push and pull, pull factors are those factors that help us understand the threats to the species and understanding these threats is important when we want to conserve these species and here we will also talk about ecotoxicology and developmental hazards what are the hazards of development what are the kinds of toxins that we are releasing in the name of development what are the negative impacts from those toxins and what kinds of uh, influences does it have on the working of the ecosystems so that is ecotoxicology in the fifth module we will ask the question can economics help and how can economics help so because a large number of these uh, decisions are occurring because of bad economic decisions we need to understand how economic decisions are made in the first place 
because once you understand economics only then will you be able to use economics to conserve the wildlife to conserve the na the natural resources so in this module we will uh, look at the need to understand control we need to understand how both of these are related and we will learn about thinking as an economist what is the thought process that goes on in an economist's mind and we will further look at interdependence and gains from trade so in a large number of cases these economic decisions are being made to maximize profits and these profits are coming from trade so trade is an essential thing that we need to understand to understand the working of the economy and this trade happens in the markets markets are places where economics works and we'll explore markets in the sixth module we will look at what is demand what is supply what is elasticity and how can government policies influence the market outcomes so suppose the market says that no we need these materials in such a large quantity that even unsustainable development is what we will go for then government has the responsibility and government has the power to ensure that these market outcomes are modulated they are tempered down so that we also ensure that everybody is able to get their due share which is what we are asking is if there is a certain group of people who say is that no we are going to go for gas guzzling vehicles we, we will want the largest size suvs even if we have to travel alone now in that case the pollution that gets released will uh, cause an impact on all the people not just the person who is driving the suv so can the government do something to desist people from using these suvs or desist people from uh, using those vehicles that are not uh, fuel efficient so this brings us to the role of government policy in the seventh module we will look at markets welfare and conservation so markets are important because they enhance the welfare of the society they enhance the surplus of the society so we will understand what is surplus how the surplus is measured and why do we want to go for economic development at all and we will look at market efficiency cost of taxation and international trade in this context in module 8 we will look at public sector and conservation so in this case we will talk about things like externalities so externalities are the impacts of one person's actions on the welfare of the bystanders so remember that we are going for economic development to increase welfare to increase surplus but if there are certain actions that reduce the welfare then those actions are known as externalities so if one person is playing a very loud music and is enjoying a party but the people in the surrounding are not able to sleep that is an externality so how can we solve this problem of externalities how can we come up with a solution that the person is able to hear music but others are also not disturbed that is externalities we will look at public goods and common resources that mostly the government supplies for and the design of the tax system which pays for the public sector and conservation in the ninth module we shall look at industrial organization and conservation so a large number of bad economic decisions are to maximize the profit they are because of cost cutting measures now why do industries go for cost cutting to understand that we need to understand how these industries make this decision of how much to produce and at what price to produce so in the ninth module we will look at the cost of production competition and monopoly so you can have a competitive market or you can have a monopolistic market where there is only one seller and we need to understand how a seller in a competitive market makes decisions and how a seller in the monopolist market makes decisions because these are the decisions that have a ramification for conservation in the 10th module we will look at labor market economics and conservation now in this case we will ask what are the uh, the markets for the factors of production that is what is the market for labor 
the people who do work are also working in a certain market they are providing their labor as a sell uh, a saleable product and they are getting wages in return that is the price that they are getting now what determines how much will be the wages what determines how many people get employed now this is important because in a number of cases we have observed that when people are very poor when their productivity is very less then to feed the people they, they will want to extend their fields into the forest so they will want to cut down forest to expand their agricultural fields now this is because their productivity is less so if we want to do conservation we will want to ensure that people are not poor everybody gets sufficient resources so that they do not have to play a very great amount of pressure on the environment so this is what we will explore in module 10 markets for factors of production earnings and discrimination and income inequality and poverty and from module 1 to 10 we will be working on several theoretical aspects that is we will make certain assumptions that people are rational beings that people want to maximize their surplus or their benefit but then in a number of cases these assumptions do not hold true because if you go to the market it is not that at all times you are trying to think that what will give me the maximum benefit it is also possible that your parents said that you should go and buy this particular brand of soap and you go and buy that particular brand of soap without giving a thought whether there are other soap brands that are probably better or cheaper now when we have this sort of a situation we are talking about the things like behavioral economics the role of psychology in economics and in the 11th module we will look at such practical issues as consumer choice so if there is an option to have two vehicles and one vehicle is say very fuel efficient it does not give out lot of pollution but it is a bit expensive and there is another vehicle that is a gas guzzler but it is cheaper how does a consumer decide which which vehicle to buy what are the psychological impacts in that the when there are two parties and they do not have sufficient information how do they process how do they make decisions when there is a shortage of information there is a shortage of processing power because remember that we had started by saying that economics is the science of making decisions about how the society manages its scarce resources now when we are making decision and we do not have the process thing power to make those decisions how do we make decisions and we'll also look at valuation of natural resources the 12th mm-hmm. module is case studies we will look, where we will look at the economics of protected areas and the economics of environmental disasters followed by a summing up and discussion so we will now touch upon how the society makes decision so we have explored that there are certain basic questions of economics what to produce how to produce how much to produce for whom to produce when to produce and such and so on now economics helps us answer these questions and in this course we shall explore how these questions are answered but the question is why do we make, why do we have these questions in the first place we have these questions because the wants are unlimited but the resources are limited so we want to have the best food we want to have the best clothes we want to have the best houses the best vehicles but our resources in fact like money that is limited so you have to make a choice do i want to have the best house and go with a not that good car or do i want to have the best car and live in probably a not so good house so wants are unlimited but resources are limited which leads to a conflict you need to make a choice because there is scarcity there is a limitation on the society's resources both at an individual scale and at the scale of the society and which is why we need economics to help us understand or study how the society manages its scarce resources how do you make this choice and when we talk about these scarcity we have a trade off at all points of time 
whether you are thinking about it or not you are doing a trade off at all points of your living life for example now that you are watching this video you could have spent this time not watching this video and you could have spent it say watching a movie or you could have gone out with your friends or probably you could have read a book or probably you could have been working somewhere now when you are watching this video you have given up all of those so there is this trade off you are giving up something to get something and such a trade off is always there at the individual level and it is also there at the society level we have this classic thing that is known as guns versus butter debate should a society spend its resources on national security that is guns or on consumer goods that is butter why because if we talk about the two things you have factories that can produce aircraft and you can use this factory to produce fighter aircraft or you can use it to produce commercial aircraft so fighter aircraft is your guns and the commercial aircraft is your butter or a commercial good now if the factory is being used to produce only the fighter aircraft that is this point so at this point the number of commercial aircraft that we have is zero on the other hand if the factory is producing only commercial aircraft then the number of fighter aircraft is zero or the society could decide at some other point so the society might say that we will have these many commercial aircrafts this line and we will have these many fighter aircrafts so or the society could choose a point like this or a, or the society could choose a point like this which is probably outside of the capacity of our industry so think such as these questions whether to go for the fighter aircraft or the commercial aircraft lead us to things known as production possibility frontiers so this line is the production possibility frontier it is giving us the option that if we were to to use our factory to the fullest extent we could choose any point on this line if we choose a point like this to so this point uh, or at this point we are making less number of commercial aircrafts and less number of fighter aircraft than is possible so if we choose this point then we will have more commercial aircraft and more fighter aircraft as compared to this point but if we choose a point outside then this is outside of our ability so we cannot have this point so this is the production possibility frontier and when we talk about the trade offs we have this trade off between guns and butter we have the trade off between efficiency and equality now efficiency is the property of society getting the most it can from its scarce resources equality is the property of distributing economic prosperity uniformly among the members of the society so when we talk about this debate we are asking the question that okay there is an industry and in this industry we are making say biscuits now these biscuits can be made using either machines or they can be made using labor if you use machines then probably the efficiency will be very large the factory will be churning out a huge quantity of biscuits so this is efficiency but in that case only the factory owner will be earning all the profits because there is no other person to share the profit with so this will create an unequal society on the other hand we could say that only labor intensive factories can be permitted so in that case we will have labor because of which we will be having less number of biscuits that are produced the efficiency goes down but now the profit is shared by so many people and so the equality is high economics helps us choose that whether we want to go with more efficiency or more equality and we have things like taxation and subsidies that promote equality at the cost of efficiency so there is always this trade off and when we have trade offs we also have cost cost 
is something that you give up to get something so when we say that when you are watching this lecture you are not able to watch a movie so the movie is the opportunity cost of watching this lecture so because we have a trade off we have a cost and when we have cost then these cost can be explicit or implicit explicit cost is something that requires an outlay of money that is if you say that you want to buy a box of pencils or a, a bar of butter what is the money that you will have to spend implicit cost uh, is a cost that does not require an outlay of money that is what you could have earned in a part time job but you not listen to this lecture so we have different costs and when we talk about economics we assume that people are rational and rational people are those people who systematically and purposefully do the best they can to achieve their objectives that is when we say that a person is rational then this person is trying to get all the information that he or she can trying to process it in such a manner that they maximize their welfare and reduce their cost so when we say that a firm is doing a profit maximization we will say that the firm is a rational firm and in this context when we talk about rational thinking a large quantum of it occurs at the margin margin means what is the incremental change a small incremental adjustment to a plan of action that is margin marginal change is a small incremental change and a good example is if you think about yourself how do you think should i study 8 hours for the exam or not study at all do you think like this because everybody knows that if you do not study for the exam at all you will probably fail so nobody thinks like this but we normally think like this that should i watch my favorite tv show for 30 minutes and study 7 and a half hours for the exam so in place of 8 hours now we are thinking not about 0 hours but we are thinking about 7.5 hours because whether i study for 7.5 hours or 8 hours won't make that much of a difference when we are thinking like this we are doing a rational thinking at the margin and a lot of rational thinking actually occurs at the margin for example if you talk about an airline and suppose the cost of flying a 200 passenger jet is 10 lakhs of rupees so the average cost of flying per passenger is 10 lakhs divided by 200 is 5000 rupees now suppose the plane is about to take off and there are five seats that are remaining and there is a passenger who is willing to pay only 3000 rupees for that seat should the airline sell the seat for 3000 rupees or not now if we think about an average thinking then we'll say that no we are selling uh, the tickets for on an average of 5000 rupees and this person is paying 3000 so we should not sell it but what happens actually is that airlines if they are rational thinkers they start to think at the margin what is this marginal thinking the airlines would uh, think that okay what is the marginal cost of putting this extra passenger because in any case the aircraft is about to take off so now there are two choices so we have choice 1 that is take off without this passenger and in this case the earning is rupees 0 because in any case the flight is going to take off the choice 2 is to get rupees 3000 from this passenger and a lot a c now once you have this extra passenger on the aircraft 
then it will also incur certain costs because there will be an increase in the weight. Now, one person on an average is like 60, 70 kgs. So what is the additional amount of fuel that will be required for this particular passenger? Let us say the additional amount of fuel that is required is 500 rupees. Because in any case, you have this aircraft that is weighing several tons and this aircraft is going to take off. If you add 60, 70 kgs extra, the, the change in the extra fuel will be very less. See, 500 rupees. And when this passenger is there in the aircraft, you'll pr probably serve him with a bag of peanuts or certain snacks. What is the cost of that snack? Now, suppose the cost of this snack is 100 rupees. So in this case, the aircraft will be earning 3000 rupees. So this is the revenue. And the cost is rupees 500 plus rupees 100 is rupees 600. So in this case, what is happening is that the marginal profit, should the aircraft permit this extra passenger, is 3000 minus 600 rupees is 2400 rupees. So if the passenger is not permitted, the aircraft, the airline will not earn this profit. But with the extra passenger, the, the airline will earn this extra profit. And even though this is less than the average cost of selling the ticket, the airline will probably permit this passenger. Because permitting this passenger is giving the airline an extra 2,400 rupees. What's wrong with that? Now, this is marginal thinking. That while on an average, the person is paying less than what the airlines charge, but marginally, the airline is at a profit. And so taking a rational decision, the aircraft should fly with this passenger. So to sum up, when we talk about making decisions, there are three important principles. One, people and society face trade-offs. Because there is a shortage of resources and our wants are unlimited, and so there is a trade-off. These trade-offs lead to cost and cost is what you give up to get something. And what you are giving up could be in the form of money. So like you are giving up 50 rupees to buy a pen. So that is the cost of this pen. Or probably you are giving out, giving out something else. So probably if you are not buying this pen, you would have spent that 50 rupees on an ice cream. So we can also say, that the cost of this pen is the ice cream that you had to go to for, for go. So cost is what you give up to get something. And here we can also talk about the opportunity cost, which is the next best alternative that you are giving up. So when we say that uh, you are giving up the ice cream that you wanted so much, then that is the opportunity cost of buying this pen. And we also saw that rational people think at the margin. Rational people are those people who take all the information, who process all the information to get to a point where they maximize their welfare. And when they try to maximize their welfare, they often think at the margin. That is small incremental changes. So when the factory is thinking at the margin, the factory is asking the question, should I produce one extra good? I have already produced 10,000 cars. Should I make the 10,001th car? When the buyer is making uh, a rational choice, thinking at the margin, he is asking, okay, I have had four chapatis. Should I eat the fifth chapati or not? And a lot of rational thinking happens at the mar margins. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.